Hello, I'm Simon Owens, and you're listening to The Business of Content, a podcast about how publishers create, distribute, and monetize their digital content. In today's episode, we're talking about the challenges of scaling a bootstrap podcast network. If you listen to the podcast called Startup, then you've heard host Alex Bloomberg go into exquisite detail about the trials and tribulations of launching a VC-funded podcast network. In earlier seasons, we got a first-hand look about what it was like to pitch venture capitalists, hire talent, and grow the business. In the final season of Startup, Bloomberg walked us through Spotify's $230 million acquisition of Gimlet. But what about bootstrap podcast networks that don't have access to millions of dollars of venture capital money? How do they get off the ground and scale? To answer these questions, I spoke to Jeff Umbro, the founder of The Podglomerate. We talked about his early mistakes in trying to partner with shows for his network and why it can be incredibly difficult to monetize a show with a small audience. Let's jump right into it. Hey, Jeff, thanks for joining us. Hey, how you doing, Simon? Thanks for having me. Uh, so you run a podcast network called The Podglomerate. Uh, we'll get to, to that in a moment. But first, I'd like to hear a little bit about how you got into the podcast business in the first place, because you kind of came into it from, you know, k- kind of sideways from another industry, right? Yeah, yeah, I did. Uh, I mean, honestly, I think a lot of people who are in podcasting today have a similar experience to what I you know went through. But I actually I came in from the world of book publishing. Um, it's it's pretty funny. I mean, not funny, but it's interesting to me. I I grew up working in bookstores. I I did nothing but read and I went to college for writing and I thought that that's what I wanted to do. Uh, And then when I got out of school, um, I got a job working at a book publicity firm. It was kind of the first thing that uh, first job I could get in the industry. And, you know, I worked there for about five years, a little more. um, And I would focus on the technology books and like a lot of nonfiction business stuff while I was there. And, you know, so books from like Ariana Huffington and Eric Schmidt and uh, Ben Horowitz. And ultimately, that led me to work with a lot of like tech oriented websites on audience development, you know, kind of on the side, I was freelancing a little bit. And one of the things that I realized is that I should be, you know, trying to drive, um, I I needed to figure out a way to like kind of bring in new clients so I could, you know, hold my own when it came to the publishing side. And one of the things that I saw people doing was creating a podcast that would act as like kind of a lead generator. So I did that with a show called Writers Who Don't Write. We launched it back in 2015, me and a friend. And, you know, we would bring authors onto the show and we would talk to them about their careers and one story that they always struggled to tell. And, you know, we were able to get all of these like amazing authors because nobody was really doing that much in like the literary author space at the time. I mean, there were definitely some folks who were doing a really great job of it. But, you know, in the same way that there was kind of gaps in in all of podcasting in every genre uh, that existed in the publishing space as well. So right off the bat, we were able to have, you know, a little bit of success and, you know, it was able to I was able to drive, you know, some new client conversions from that. Um, so you relaunched the podcast as a way to generate new business leads for your book, pub- pub- your book publicity business. Yeah, and basically. just to be clear, I, I worked for a company that did book publicity. It wasn't my company. Um, but but yeah, that was one of the reasons that I did it. I also just really enjoyed the work uh, in, in talking to these authors that I really admired. And, um, you know, it was it was fun. It was like a creative outlet for me. I had had the same desk job for five plus years. And and as anybody can relate, you know, it gets old. Uh, So through, you know, a a very random string of events, I found myself in a position with uh, a little bit of extra cash in the bank and, uh, you know, no job. Um, I had left my job to go work on a quick contract position. You know, I kind of needed the change. And when I was finished, my plan was either like go back to publishing or try something new. And for once in my life, I was in this situation where like I had a little bit of cash and I didn't have a ton of responsibility. So I said, you know, it's now or never. So I started a podcast company, which uh, it was back in July of 2017. We officially launched. And at the time we were looking at this as kind of like a place where we could bundle together a bunch of podcasts that were not necessarily large enough to like sell ads on their own uh, and sell ads on their behalf. And I very quickly realized like why that wouldn't necessarily work. Uh, 
you know, it, there are companies that are capable of doing it and that do a good job of that. But for the most part, it's it's kind of a nightmare to try and, uh, you know, to do something like that for, for a number of reasons, including quality control, including outreach, including, um, you know, the, the fact of the matter is that, like, you don't really get useful conversions on a show if you advertise on it until you're at, like, a certain scale, um, which is, is not a blanket statement, but is generally true. So we we quickly kind of, I guess you'd say pivoted. And, you know, the Poglomerate today uh, is kind of a threefold company. We produce podcasts, both originals and white label, you know, meaning a company will come to us and say, we want to create this show. How can you help us do that? Uh, and then so that, that all falls under production. Then we run what we call distribution campaigns which is some combination of publicity, marketing, cross-promotion, retailer merchandising, and paid opportunities if there's a budget. And we do that for you know both shows that we have created ourselves and for shows in some instances that hire us to do that you know, uh, under our umbrella, but using their like original productions. And then the third kind of lever that we use within the podglomerate is uh, monetization, which for us typically means ad sales. But in some instances, means you know live events, premium content, that kind of thing. So uh, you know, just to kind of unpack some stuff. So I was reading back this interview that I did with you a few years ago, and I was writing an article, and that's how we first got introduced. Mm -hmm. Is like your your initial inspiration for starting the podglomerate was that um, you know advertising networks were kind of approaching you or kind of kicking the tires to see if you possibly wanted to join with your own podcast. And but they would see look at your download numbers and you, you know kind of ghost you after that. Is that kind of what you remember happening? And that was kind of your initial frustration that that led to you trying to start a a, uh, a your own. Yeah, network? I mean that's definitely like one of the reasons why I started it. You know, in, in my mind, I was creating this like really valuable vehicle to reach people who are interested in like authors and books, and and we were having these people approach us, seeing that value. And then deciding that it wouldn't work because the scale was too small. Uh, and one of the reasons that I wanted to start the network was was so that I could help these smaller uh, podcasts, you know, that had these niche audiences kind of grow. And, and like I said, it just became like really apparent that like if you're going to do something like that, uh, you know, to help these small shows grow and, and sell ads, then you just need like some kind of reservoir of of resources. And, and you you really need to say like I'm okay with not making much money for a little while um which is fine if you're able to do that but like ultimately like i, I now i guess i'm more empathetic with the networks that, that kind of turned us down a couple years ago now that i've i've seen firsthand like what needs to go into like monetizing a show so yeah that's really interesting um and so yeah because like a you know mid-roll famously you know you have to have a minimum at least as of a few years ago fifty thousand downloads per episode before they would even consider you and they would you know if you ask them why is so that that's just like you know that's the scale they needed to be able to you know even begin to attract advertisers you were kind of frustrated with that so you started this and i remember in the early days you were just working you were kind of launching new shows or kind of uh, adopting already existing shows into your network but it sounds like th that's what you were running up against that that scale problem that, that you, you couldn't really get advertisers all that interested because you just yeah, didn't I mean, have it, the, the it, audience. It simplifying so, things, right? the answer is yes. Uh, and it's funny now because we get emails like almost every day from shows that are like, you know, at or a little bit below the scale that we were at at that point. Um, and, <laughs> you know, it is, uh, I feel a little guilty even saying this, but I mean, I, I look at these emails now and I'm just like, why would anybody approach me with a show that's getting 100 downloads thinking that I'll be able to like help them monetize that? And, uh, you know, I, I totally understand, like, as I'm saying this, how much of a hypocrite I sound like. But, um, you know, I, I, I've I guess the difference between now and a couple of years ago is that, you know, I've, I've learned kind of like what all of these formulas are and what needs to go into a show to make it successful and, and the different ways that people measure uh, you know, like what constitutes as successful. So it sounds like what you pivoted into was something that we're seeing a lot of, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's kind of like, you know, the model that you see with like, you know, Pineapple Street Media and some of these others where 
you're partnering with already existing entity. So like, let's say it's a brand like GE or something. And they're like, we, we want to launch, we want to launch a podcast, but we need, we don't have in-house talent. So you, so they're basically outsourcing it to you. So that's like, so when you say the production arm of, of that kind of three-legged stool, is that what you're talking about for the production? Yes and no. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so yes, people approach us all the time uh, with RFPs um, or requests for proposals on what it would look like if we were to kind of create a show on their behalf. Uh, and, and that could look like a lot of different things. Um, it could, you know, be kind of like a consulting position to try and figure out what the structure of a show should and could look like. It might be like the actual act of like recording the audio and editing it. Um, and, you know, more often than not, that is the case where somebody wants to create a show and they have like all different kinds of reasons for doing so. Sometimes it's awareness, sometimes it's to monetize like their content, sometimes it's to extend their brand. Um, there's a hundred like uh, examples I could point to for all of these things. Um, and so, yes, we do that, uh, which, you know, on, on one hand, we, we really enjoy it. And on the other, it's kind of a means to an end. So it puts money in the bank so that we can, you know, then turn around and create original shows that, that we, you know, have fun with and that we've wanted to kind of explore for a long time. So on the production arm, like that is kind of, that is a little bit accurate in terms of like comparing us to like a pineapple street. But I mean, we're certainly not as successful as they are because, you know, they have like half their clients are like fortune 500 brands. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so you, so, the, so you, these brands can hire you to produce their podcast. And then the second arm is they can hire you. They might have an already existing podcast. Oh, let me back up a little bit. So for the production arms are, is that, do you have like in-house talent that's producing these or are you like, like some of these heads of these, these consultants that I've talked to, like I, I interviewed one out in LA, she has like a huge spreadsheet of contracts of, of like, uh, you know, con, you know, freelancers who do different things from production to, to edit. Uh, is that kind of what you guys are doing where you have just all your contacts and you can assemble a team together? What's the, what, how do you kind of assemble these, uh, th these teams to, to help with the production? Yeah. I, I mean, to an extent, like we, we build the team around like what the production is. But I mean, we have, uh, you know, a, my, my partner in the business, his name is Chris and he is our head of production. Uh, he comes from the video world and, you know, he's had all these like amazing clients like, you know, Nike and Sotheby's and, uh, vice and you name it. Um, so he's kind of the lead on the production front. Uh, but then we also have like a small army of freelancers that we work with pretty often. Um, you know, I kind of know who is effective at what kind of show based on like the the previous work that we've done with them um so to answer your question in a less roundabout way uh we have a couple you know like, like kind of full-timers and then we work with many more uh, part-timers and freelancers and so that's the one bucket of what you do uh and then um the other thing they can hire to to do is if they have an already existing podcast team they're already creating a podcast they can hire you for the marketing aspect yep yeah so we have worked with uh show in and, and, and you know i do want to clarify that you know when somebody uh hires us like you know they are sometimes you know kind of like sole proprietors sometimes they work within like a larger network and, and people come to us for all kinds of reasons um you know we've had shows that like suddenly find themselves with a marketing budget and want to know how best to spend it we've had shows that like have a really great product but they need help with the actual launch and we've had shows that um like are looking like very specifically to hit like a a niche uh very particular audience um, some of our clients include uh, Serial Box, which is like a, an audiobook, ebook bundler. Uh, it's an app. Um, it's a really exciting company. Uh, they're doing a lot of really cool stuff. Um, we've worked with uh, Dax Global, which is kind of like the UK, the UK's version of iHeartRadio. We've worked with Castbox, Pocket Casts, The Daily Dot. Oh, and and you know, for example, right now we're currently working with uh, a show that's part of the PRX network. And, you know, all of them have, have different goals in mind. Uh, and, and just to clarify, you know, the show had hired us, not PRX. But yeah, everybody is looking for something very particular. Uh, and it's usually some form of either or some combination of, you know, traditional publicity, traditional marketing. Uh, and, and so publicity we define as like, you know, reaching out to 
outlets for reviews or, or including a show within a collection uh, of like a themed list or something or an interview with the host or the production team. Uh, and then there's marketing, which is, you know, we'll work with a brand to help them determine kind of how to take their existing platforms and drive that towards new podcast downloads and subscriptions. Uh, and that could be anything from like talking to them about their email newsletters or like the structure of their website or their social media to, you know, signing them up for like a Quora session or a Reddit AMA. Uh, and then, you know, cross promotion, which is basically like pitching the talent of one show to be a guest on another or swapping like ad space between shows. Um, there's retailer merchandising, which is essentially getting a show featured in uh, one of the different podcasting apps, like an editor's choice or a new and noteworthy or an episode we love or some kind of themed collection. Uh, and then finally, if there's a budget, like we, we do a lot of work with paid opportunities, which could be anything from like social media to Reddit and Google to you know, buying space within podcasting apps, uh, to buying space within podcasts themselves, to buying space on email newsletters. So there's a lot of different ways that uh, you can kind of bring attention to an audience and, and kind of grow that audience. So where where's the biggest bang for your buck going to be in terms of marketing uh, in the sense of, you know, it, you mentioned a few things there that I think would probably be the most effective, which would be, you know, the host swaps in terms of getting your getting your hosts interviewed on other podcasts and then also purchasing um, either doing ad swaps or purchasing ads on other podcasts. Where, where do you see a lot of your, you know, obviously every little bit helps. You should have a good, you know, Twitter strategy, uh, email newsletter strategy, but where are you seeing like the most effective strategy for, uh, you know, getting a, a building an audience for a podcast. Yeah, I mean, that's tough because there's not really like a one thing that I can point to. Um, I actually find that all of this works together pretty cohesively. Um, you know, for example, if you're featured on TuneIn or something, then like I find it really effective to then share that on your social media. Uh, and then the two pieces kind of work together. I mean, obviously, like a feature on Apple or something is going to be incredibly effective. Uh, or getting like a some kind of interview or cross promotion within a podcast that's incredibly relevant to to what your show is is super helpful. Um, but that's not to say that like you know you can't buy ten thousand dollars worth of overcast ads and you know achieve the same thing. So I mean it's just a, a really broad question. Um, yeah, but I've I've heard that like the like the most effective marketing is within the podcast ecosystem itself. Like the biggest jump I ever heard I ever had in listeners was when I went and appeared on an as an interviewee. I was interviewed on the Tech Mean Daily podcast, which has like a huge audience, and like my next podcast episode after that got you know a huge jump in downloads, and that's where I've consistently heard you know, within the industry that the, the, like, driv like, it's a lot, you, it's a lot easier to get someone to listen to another podcast if you hear them on another podcast versus, you know, even getting someone with a lot of Twitter followers to share your podcast episode or anything like that. Well, and, and I think that, you know, those examples have mm -hmm. to do with, I mean, yeah, there's, there's logic behind it. Like anybody who's already listening to a podcast doesn't need to like go through the steps of learning how to download a podcast. All they have to do is, you know, have a couple taps on their phone and they can subscribe to your show, uh, especially if, you know, for example, Tech Meme included your show in their show notes. That said, and that so there's a much lower barrier to entry than like, you know, if my mom saw a tweet that she then wanted to go and like subscribe to the show, like there's a lot of steps between like point A and point B. That said, you know, it, it really is just an anecdotal example um, because, you know, for every one instance where you know you double your audience from being a guest on Tech Meme, you're going to have like a thousand interviews that you do that, that don't really like have any effect. So I mean, I, I yes, in in short, you're you're probably correct that appearing as a guest on like relevant shows or something like that will be really effective. But I mean, it's just like a really broad thing to say in my mind. Like what we do is uh, we will kind of determine like the CPA for every different initiative that we take in the same way that you would like a smart campaign on like Facebook would be like a B testing a couple ads. You can do that to an extent using every example that I mentioned. So, mm -hmm. so, you know, we, we really try and do that. I mean, that said, like there, there's going to be some obvious hits that like are going to be more effective than others. Uh, so it's just a matter of using like, you know, creative thinking when you're, uh, 
when you're trying to determine like where to put your efforts. And then the third, the third bucket that you mentioned was advertising. So how does, how does that relationship work? Like where you're, you're helping a podcast, uh, you know, find sponsors. Uh, so we well, in this instance, we, we call them partners. Um, you know, we, we sell ads on all of our original shows. Uh, and you know, if a brand hires us to create a show on their behalf and they want sponsorships, then we'll also do that for them. Um, but then we also have a couple shows that like we don't really help at all with the production or the distribution, but we do, we do help them when it comes to selling ads. Um, and there's a few different ways to go about that. Uh, let's just assume for the sake of this conversation that like the show we're talking about has like 20,000 downloads an episode. Uh, and it will be like a desirable category for a, a number of advertisers. Um, and, and I mean, you can pretty easily figure that out by looking at like a show and, and, you know, you can find how you can find out how successful it is in a number of different ways. Uh, in this case, we're deeming success as like selling ads. Uh, I will take a show. I will put together uh, like some kind of press kit or synopsis guide or informational deck, uh, a media kit, if you will, um, and you know it will highlight a lot of the features of the show, including like some of the bigger guests that have been on there, some of the bigger reach or press hits that it's had. Uh, like who our target audience is. If I have access to like any demographics, I'll include those. And I'll basically come up with like a menu that's really, really simple for anybody to follow. And it'll say something like this show publishes once a week. It uh, can reach 20,000 people within the first 30 days of publication. We know based on like X, Y, and Z, uh, and I'll, I'll usually note that it's like IAB compliant or where we're getting our data from just so that like a savvy, uh, like somebody savvy will figure that out, that it's um, like relevant. And we'll say something like, you know, 20,000 people within 30 days, 90% female between 23 and 44 with an average income of X, Y, and Z. Um, and we will say uh, like, these are the different offerings that we have, uh, whether it's dynamic insertion or a baked in ad, uh, and we'll break that down and explain exactly what that means. You know, dynamic insertion for X amount of impressions or a baked in ad for one year with like a guaranteed like Y number of downloads. Um, and we know all of this because, you know, we know our shows pretty well and we track these numbers all the time and we're updating our spreadsheets every day. Uh, and I will send this to all of the agencies. There's seven or eight of them of note in the podcasting space. Uh, and I will also create a list of advertisers whom I think will be interested in the podcast. Uh, and I'll do this, you know, based on like my analysis of the space. Uh, and, you know, that might be um, listening to a number of similar shows, which you can find by looking at like the recommended podcast algorithms within all of the different apps. Uh, or, you know, there's a really helpful tool I use called Pod Sites. P-O-D-S-I-G-H-T-S. Uh, and they have a function in there where you can actually search. For, and there's another company called Magellan that does something similar. Uh, both of them have a function where you can actually search for a particular podcast. Uh, and you can see who has advertised on that show in the last uh, like three months or we set the constraints. So I'll be able to say you know, ZipRecruiter has advertised on like this show in the last three months. This show is very similar to the show that I'm pitching. So like, I want to reach out to them. In this particular instance, ZipRecruiter is a client of one of the agencies. But in most instances, like if you, if you do your research, you can find like anywhere from 20 to 50 advertisers that like are not necessarily large enough to be working with one of these agencies. So I will create a spreadsheet uh, that includes all of these like direct brands and I'll just spend an afternoon like digging through all of the databases that we have access to, uh, you know, Twitter, Google, uh, Cision or something like that. And Media Radar is a great one if you have a budget for it. And we'll create this spreadsheet that says like, this is the marketing coordinator responsible for this brand. Uh, and we'll take that email that we'd previously written with all of the demographic data and, and our sales numbers, and we will send it to all of the agencies and to all of these brands, at which point they'll come back to us and say something like, uh, 
hey, I'd like to run a test um, for this brand on your show for these three episodes, and we will pay you this amount of money. There's some kind of negotiation process that will occur at that point based on like the agency trying to lower the CPM or you trying to raise it. And then, you know, you record the ad, you run it. And if the agency is happy with the results, again, it all comes down to like a formula, uh, like what they spend versus what they get from it. Uh, then they'll renew the campaign. And, and it's kind of a beautiful thing because for the most part, if you run a really successful campaign that actually converts listeners to, to consumers then, uh, or to purchasers, then in my experience, a lot of these brands are happy to just keep throwing their money at you. Well, like how much demand is there? Like uh, you're, you're preparing all these emails, you're creating this huge spreadsheet. Like, are you sending, assuming that most of these people aren't going to respond to you, especially the smaller brands that might not, you know, have, uh, you know, but like as huge a budget or are you just like getting flooded with incoming people who need more, in, need more inventory to buy ads on? Like, what's the kind of demand side of this? Yeah, I mean, I, I wish I could give you like a straight answer. Uh, I know I'm I'm kind of sidestepping all of your questions, but like <laughs> there is no like uh, there is no silver bullet for any of this. Um, I, I think that there's obviously demand as as like you can see with all of the different studies that are coming out year over year that show like all of these advertisers who are spending more money in the space. Um, I mean, honestly, in my mind, those estimates that you see in like the like Edison Infinite Dial report and everything. Are actually kind of like slow in their reporting uh and i i'm not basing that off of anything other than what i've seen i i'm seeing like quite a bit of demand we have a couple shows where we've you know been able to sell all of our ad space throughout the rest of 2019 uh we're recording this in october uh for anyone listening um in, in you know some shows where we've even sold like well into 2020 uh and then we have some shows that like it's a struggle uh you know we, we really have to push for every sale and it's gotten to the point where like, I think we've just gotten smarter about like what the different brands are looking for. Um, so we can actually focus like our production side of things towards like, if it's a show that needs to make money on ad sales and like we can focus our production based on, you know, what these agencies will be interested in. Well, like, so you've been in this game for a few years now, like given the, the rapid growth in in the advertising market for podcasts have you noticed that anecdotally on your side that like that, that you're having to spend a lot less time educating advertisers that they're they're more receptive as time goes on like do you see that scale happening in your own kind of business yes and no uh i'm seeing that we have less we don't need to educate like brands that have been in the space for a while they know exactly what they're looking for and you know 9 out of 10 times our conversation has to do with like what the CPM is going to be as opposed to like, they know that they want to buy it. It's just a matter of if they can get the price where they want it to be. Um, mm -hmm. But I am educating people all the time. I've calls multiple times a week with, with brands that have never bought in the podcast space before who, you know, like some of them are, are pretty savvy and some of them don't know the difference between like a dynamic insertion and a baked in ad, which is fine. It's just like, there's a certain amount of education that goes into this process um, you know, you were asking before, like, or you were hinting at anyway, like how much time it would take me to actually prepare one of these spreadsheets and like, uh, and send it out for one of our shows and like what we get in return, you know, it, it's, it's hit or miss sometimes. Like I've had one show where like we, we purposely did not pitch it for any ads until we were like 10 or 20 episodes in because we wanted to build up this demand. And you know, I had had a lot of inbound interest in this. So by the time we were ready to send out one of these email blasts, we got, I think, nine responses within two hours that were all interested in buying some space. Um, but then we've had, you know, crickets on the other end on occasion. So it, it's, uh, so it, we usually have to set us, like, we'll usually get some people who say right off the bat, like, I want to spend X amount of dollars with you uh, and I want to air it like in these months. And then sometimes, you know, we have to go back and forth with the company for, for months before they actually pull the trigger. But I'm fine with that because some of the time, like you put in, you know, the effort to actually, uh, I guess, convince somebody that this is worth their time and worth their while. And, you know, we've had clients that have been with us for years that have, have ultimately sent us a lot of money. 
that like it, it's it's worth putting in the effort for. And I'm guessing the more podcasts you're working with, the easier it gets because you're not having to do a one to one one on one. Oh, what am I trying to say? You're not trying to have to do deal each deal one by one because you can sell ads across several podcasts. Like they're looking for for scale, correct? Sometimes I think I, I mean you'd be surprised. These are really savvy companies for the most part that are buying this ad space, and they know that like what works here might not work there. Um, you know, we have a lot of shows that are within the same vertical, and and like oftentimes we can sell a show across or an ad across multiple shows, but it's not always the case. Are you mostly working with, with direct response advertisers who are giving you some kind of code discount code that the podcaster can use so they can, they can measure their direct yeah. impact. Yeah, We're, we're actually just getting to the point now where um, we're kind of at the scale where people are, are interested in like some general awareness campaigns. Um, but I mean, 90% of everything we sell is direct response. So you mentioned earlier, like your the kind of original podcast that you are launching. So it sounds like some notion of the podglomerate um, network exists. Can you? T- what's your approach there? Like it seems like the way you're describing it now, it's still a little bit of a passion project that you're trying to grow on the side. What What are you doing on that? On that? In end? in terms of the the original productions. Yeah, you mentioned that you're you're using the money you're making through the production, marketing, and and advertising sales to launch yeah. original podcasts. Did I interpret that yep. correctly? Yeah. So we uh, some examples of those shows would be um, you know we have a show called Not Skinny but Not Fat, which is uh, a show hosted by Amanda Hirsch, who is the brains behind the Not Skinny but Not Fat Instagram account. Uh, it's a lot of it's a meme account that really specializes in like celebrity culture and reality television that kind of thing um and she comes in you know with the massive audience she has like 150,000 followers on instagram and she wanted to launch a show so her and i sat down and we talked about what that show would look like and uh you know we helped her to create that so in the show it's you know either her and her sister talking about like the like celebrity news of the week or they bring in a guest from uh you know We've had a lot of people from Vanderpump Rules, from Southern Charm, from Real Housewives, a lot of uh, like Instagram celebrities. Um, And they just generally chat about like, you know, what's happening in pop culture news. And this is an example of a show that's been pretty successful for us because like we were coming on board with an existing audience of people who love her from Instagram. But then we're also able to tap into people who like, uh, you know, Bachelor Party, which is the Wandery ABC collaboration for, you know, the Bachelor podcast or uh like rose buddies or there's a lot of um like existing shows in this space where we can kind of like cross promote um and advertise on these shows to kind of grow our audience and then this is a show like what i was talking about before that has like a uh a very desirable audience on the ad side because it's mostly millennial females um and there just aren't that many shows that serve that audience so you know we've had a lot of success in selling space on that so you know, on the one hand, it's a lot of fun. Uh, you know, I, it, it's not like what I naturally would have kind of driven myself towards with an original production, but like I've come to love it. Uh, and I really see the value in something that can like make somebody's day better. Um, and, but then we also have some shows like, for example, The History of Stand Up, which is a, uh, a show I'm pretty passionate about. It's the history of stand-up comedy from vaudeville to Netflix. Uh, we've done two seasons. The first is exactly like what I just said. And then the second was um, like a deep dive into seven famous locations in like kind of comedy lore. Uh, it's kind of like if NPR did the history of stand-up. It's a heavily reported uh, like magazine style show. And some of the guests on this show include uh, Tig Notaro, Pete Holmes, Margaret Cho, Judd Apatow, Nick Kroll. Uh, and, and so that's the kind of thing where it's just like a lot of fun f- to make. It's fascinating. It's shedding light on this like really like fun subject that I think most people are interested in. Um, and this is something that has done really well for us. You know, it's been written up in as like a best podcast of the year in Vulture. The New York Times called it illuminating. Uh, iHeartRadio called it the best podcast of, of September back in 2018. Um, you know, so this is the kind of thing that kind of elevates us uh when it comes to us pitching new shows because they know that we've made this but it also is something that provides us with a lot of downloads that we can monetize um 
so so those are two examples of of you know 10 shows that uh we have right now that um like our original productions that we've made which will ultimately be like a sustainable business like all all on its own it's just a matter of us getting to the point where we have the scale to actually make it so um and and we are getting there like a lot of we have a pnl for all of our shows a profit and loss sheet and you know i i can't tell you you know how many or which but a lot of our shows have, have crossed that threshold into the profit line so well what's the benefit of doing the original podcast first what you're doing on the other end like is it just because you're gonna you own these podcasts so therefore you get a hundred percent of the upside whereas you know with the you know the marketing or the production you're just being paid a set amount so it isn't as scalable like what's the what, what's the ultimate uh, I dream mean, here all of the above uh i mean number one above everything else is that it's fun like i enjoy doing it i'm passionate about it i want to create things and put them out in the world uh number two is is yeah it's it's a better business model than a partnership uh so like so the the one half of your business, the one that's making probably the most money or is the most profitable right now is kind of like a pineapple street media, but the originals can be compared to like a gimlet media where you have more control over, you know, everything that's going on from every, just about every aspect of the production and monetization process. Right. So I do want to clarify it. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I didn't say at all, like which one of our like business models are making more money. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> so uh, I'm not saying that you're wrong. It's just like, I, I didn't say that. Um, and, but yeah, I mean, we, we have, uh, a few different models that we're kind of like exploring and ultimately, I mean, we're scrappy. We didn't take any investment money when we launched. Uh, we are a small company compared to a Gimlet or a Wondery or a Pineapple Street. Um, you know, two of the three of which have been purchased since, uh, they launched, uh, and Pineapple Street also didn't take any venture funding. Um, so it's even more impressive what they've been able to do. So like we we have to find a model that that pays us basically. Um, and if that means that for now we have to do all three of these things, that's fine with me. Uh, I'm not saying that we want to do it forever, uh, but you know right now it's what's working. And what are your thoughts on kind of the the platform wars between you know the Spotify's the luminaries of the world? Do you think like you, you know I would you're scrappy you're you would probably still consider yourself an independent uh, podcast network? Um, are you is this excite you because it means that more money and more people are coming into the space, or are you worried about kind of like a you know what Facebook did to uh, like online digital media in the sense of how they start? introducing algorithms and then if you're not paying to play then suddenly they choke off distribution like what where is your mind on that in terms of how it might affect independent podcasters i mean the <laughs> i <laughs> i'm skirting all of your answers um i i think that there's a lot of different ways to look at this um yes it's very exciting because every one of the like both new and legacy industry or uh, companies in the space are buying up a lot of like a companies and b content um you know iheart westwood one uh cumulus dax global uh i mean all of entercom all of these traditional radio stations and companies are getting into the podcasting space uh by either buying companies or buying original content um and then you have you know these uh these new companies that are, are starting to do the same um you know, Spotify, Luminary, uh, I know Himalaya is buying a lot of original stuff. Um, all of these companies are providing an outlet for creators like us to <clears throat> theoretically, you know, like make cool stuff and show it to the world and, and get paid to do it. Um, I, I think it's way too soon to tell if it's a good thing or not that we have like these walled gardens that are appearing. I personally am for it because I, I just think it's like another model out there that allows people to make a living doing what they love. Um, and I understand, you know, better than most people that it's a business, uh, you know, in the same way in, that the book world has, you know, book publishers and then distributors, like we're seeing the same thing in the podcast space. Uh, you know, there are better analogies, I'm sure, in like the film or the music or the TV space. But this is just like something that, it's bound to happen. If it doesn't work with Luminary, then somebody else is going to try it. There's a lot of people who have already tried it. Uh, and and I, I 
you know, above all else, it's kind of like a, an embarrassment of riches for the consumer. Like for the everyday listener, they don't really care that Spotify now owns Gimlet. What they care about is that they have all of these really amazing shows from Gimlet who now happens to have more resources than ever before to make cool stuff. So I don't know if that if that's like what you were looking for. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I think I agree with you that it's, 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 I, you know, there is that little bit of worry because, you know, now my podcast is now on Spotify, but I, but Spotify is now creating its own originals. So I'm just like, well, how much, how much, uh, real estate is it going to get my podcast when it's prioritizing its own? But at the same time, uh, it, it shows like how early we are. And in the process and like the growth curve of podcasting, I mean, you look at a lot of the most famous YouTubers, a lot of them were people who got in really early to the platform. And I feel like I and, you know, a lot of other people in the space, you know, we got in early and like there's still a ton of growth ahead. So there's 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 a lot of potential because uh, so much money and so and so much talent is moving into the space. Yeah. And I mean, that's definitely true. Uh, I actually think what Studio 71 is doing in the podcast space is, is fascinating. Um, and they're a big like YouTube talent agency. Uh, they're basically pushing all of their talent into podcasting and, and they're doing a, a pretty good job of it in my mind. Um, like, I don't know anything about their financials, so I can't tell you if it's, if it makes sense on that regard, but you see their shows at the top of the charts all the time. Apple loves them because, you know, they're bringing all of these, uh, like, like already massive talents from elsewhere into the space, which ultimately is going to do nothing but grow the podcasting pie as a whole. Um, I don't know. It, it's been really interesting, exciting to to watch this happen. Um, I think that there's, a, I mean, outside of, of like YouTubers, there's also Instagrammers and people from TikTok and former people from Vine and, you know, big Twitter personalities. And, uh, you know, even folks who have like giant newsletters are are starting to move into the podcast space. It makes sense. It's like a pretty, uh, I mean, I, I hate this phrase, but it's low hanging fruit to move into the space. Like, yes, there are different levels of of what constitutes like a quality show, but you know, that's not necessarily up to like you and I to decide. It's up to the listener to decide if they want to spend their time with it. Yeah, it's interesting. I just conducted an interview. It's going to come out before this episode that people are listening to now uh, with the one of the founders of Famebit, which was, you know, uh, uh, it was it's been acquired by Google and YouTube, but it was like a marketplace for uh, YouTubers to find advertisers, basically bring them together. And they're just about to launch a new platform called Podcorn that basically does the same thing where it, it allows, uh, you know, potential advertisers to put out RFPs and connect um, it and connect them with, you know, podcasters who can bid on those RFPs. So uh, it's definitely, you can see, you can see a lot of analogous stuff that happened with YouTube maybe eight years ago is now happening in the podcast space. Yeah. And, and it's funny too, because, you know, we started off this interview by you asking me about, you know, kind of like bundling a bunch of podcasts together, selling ads on their behalf. Um, I mean, that's basically what programmatic advertising is. And, you know, there are a lot of companies that are doing it really successfully at this point. You know, we, we use Megaphone whenever we don't have direct ad sales, we use Megaphone's programmatic to like backfill our episodes. And I'm really happy with that. Like it might not be like the like greatest experience ever for listeners, but in my experience with it, like it's, it's not a bad one. And I think that most listeners understand that, you know, they might need to hear 30 seconds of, of like a pre-recorded ad spot so that we can kind of like, you know, pay for our hosting or something like that. So, and then there's, you know, all kinds of other platforms that have done a really successful job of, of what I tried to do initially, like AdvertiseCast, for example. Okay, Jeff. Well, those were all the questions I had. Where can people find you online? I am at Jeff Umbro, J-E-F-F-U-M-B-R-O, uh, pretty much on all social media. And uh, you can check us out at the Podglomerate, P-O-D-G-L-O-M-E-R-A-T-E dot com. Uh, and make sure to sign up for our newsletter. Awesome. Well, this was a lot of fun. Thanks so Thank much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Okay, that's all we have for you today. Be sure to subscribe to the Business of Content on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast. See you next week.